Welcome to episode 39 of the Hunt Backcountry podcast. This is a very special one with our friend Corey Jacobson. Corey is someone you probably know, hopefully you know if you're an elk hunter. He's a multi-time world champion elk caller as well as, more importantly, being a very accomplished do-it-yourself hunter. Today we talk elk hunting topics, of course, but we also get the lowdown on a brand new project that I'm super excited to share with you guys. It is the University of Elk Hunting that Corey has put together through his site, elk101.com. So you'll hear more about this project and how you can access this resource uh, in the show, but wanted to let you know right up front, Corey shared an awesome offer with us that we get to pass along with you guys, and that is to use the discount code BACKCOUNTRY. One word, BACKCOUNTRY, as in the Hunt BACKCOUNTRY podcast. If you do that when you check out Uh, this University of Elk Hunting online course at elk101.com and use that coupon code, you'll save 40%. So basically the way this works, and again, you hear more about it, but it is a complete course, everything from tag selection and states and draw odds and all the preseason stuff and scouting and calling and, I mean, everything you can imagine about elk hunting, it's all in this online course. You get access to it for a year You can go at your own pace. You can work through the modules on your own time. You can skip through and just hit the topics you're interested in. There's tens of thousands of words of content written. There's videos, all kinds of good stuff. So it truly is an amazing resource. Uh, I've had the good fortune of seeing it develop um, and have been nothing but impressed by it. So just for you guys, the listeners of this podcast, use the word code word backcountry. You'll save 40% uh, when you check that out. Hope you enjoy the show. As always, would love uh, to see your review on iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you're listening to this. As well, go ahead and email us at podcast at xmountaingear.com. With any questions you might have, comments, guest suggestions, topics, suggestions, any of the above, we would love to hear from you. All right, here's the show with Corey. Well, Corey, welcome back to the Hunt Back Country podcast. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Mark. Yeah. We were getting ready to hop on with Steve, and he had a, a fire hop up last minute that he's putting out. So it'll just be the two of us chatting about. I think what, I think what that really means is the weather finally got nice, and he yeah, went for he, a mountain bike ride. Right? Yeah, he's out on the trail. Right? <laughs> is it nice up in Idaho right now? You know, Where you're we've at anyway? had like thirty mile an hour winds the last two days, and it just this afternoon finally died down to a slight breeze. So it's tolerable uh-huh. to go outside. Yeah. Oh, that's good. We're literally getting some crazy spring thunderstorms high winds everything else right now so i'm certainly uh inside and online today (laughs) (laughs) so uh it's pretty exciting show i think and i'm sure uh exciting for you to talk about a big project um that i know you've put tons and tons of hours and effort and energy into have worked with others to bring to life and it's something that you know, I was made aware of, what, six, eight months ago at this point, so I know how much you've been working on it. Um, so go ahead and let's let the cat out of the bag and first talk about the high level, um, what is being offered uh, here right now. Absolutely. So, you know, it's just a little little background. Uh, we started Elk 101 about eight years ago, and the whole purpose for Elk 101 was a landing page where people could sign up for a an elk hunting class that we were doing at Cabela's, and it spawned into into what it is today. You know, we we had a couple people come to that class, and uh, from there we've got six, seven million uh, visits, views a year on the website, and it's always been uh, set up and structured around teaching people about elk hunting in every aspect of it. You know, that goes so deep that it's it's really hard to pull it under one umbrella. But at the heart of Elk 101 is sharing my passion uh, and experiences of elk hunting and doing so in a way that will enable other people to uh, either be motivated to go elk hunting for the first time, uh, either overcome insecurities or difficulties or challenges to become a better elk hunter, to be more successful uh, to teach people, you know, very detailed things, you know, on how to use Google Earth, how to use elk calls, things like that. And so with that basic premise of, of what Elk 101 was set up as, uh, we're super excited because about a year ago, uh, 
I was looking for a platform to be able to launch uh, an idea that I'd been kicking around in my mind for a couple of years. And it just, the timing worked out, everything worked out, and uh, we're excited to launch it. And what it is, it's an educational product. It's the University of El Cantin online course. So not to be confused with the University of El Cantin DVD that we released a few years ago. Uh, this is a full online course similar to what you take, you know, Hunter's Education online course or uh, college classes online course. And... Basically, I start out at the very beginning and walk through every step and every phase of elk hunting with as much of a detailed explanation, video components where needed, uh, diagrams, all of that. And it's, uh, it's, it's the most comprehensive and complete resource that's ever been created on elk hunting, whether you're a new hunter, a seasoned hunter, uh, whether you're a rifle hunter, an archery hunter, there is every bit of information you could you could even fathom has been brought into this platform yeah that's awesome so just to before we dive into maybe some of the content that's covered i mean I know you mentioned some things but just to recap and explain for some listeners who i'm sure may be wondering well, what does this really look like how does it work what am <laughs> i actually getting so you know you pay to have access to this online course um, and then you kind of mentioned there's so there's written content, video content, diagrams. Kind of talk about the way that um, things are sort of broken up in modules, and then really how um, a user would sort of interact and learn and walk through the process of um, completing this course, if you will. For sure. So it's it's set up as a standalone course on Elk 101. So basically, you can go to Elk 101. You'll find the course. You uh, you sign up for the membership for the course. That allows you full access to the course for one year from the time you sign up. And then the course is actually set up, as, as, as you mentioned, there's a lot of written. In fact, there's over 120,000 words, which if you uh, do a search, the average length of a novel is about 64,000. So this is like two novels packed into, into writing. Goodness. The really cool part about you know digital format is we're able to incorporate diagrams and pictures, interactive type things that you're able to to get a really good feel and understanding of what's trying to be explained, as well as there are uh, 58 video components in this course. So uh, it's broken up into into basically sections, and each section is called a module. So there are 16 modules. Within each module, there are two to three chapters, so it's broken down even further uh, into different subcategories, I guess you could call them. Uh, and then, yeah, again, 120,000 words, 200 and some images and diagrams, and 58 components of video that basically, you, you start at the beginning if you want. It's, there's a, a title page that you can start and click on whatever chapter you want to go to if you want to bounce around, if you're... You know, if you're not interested in learning about applying for tags out of state, if you're not interested in learning about uh, calling elk because you're, you're a rifle hunter, if you want the, the anatomy diagrams of the elk, we have full anatomy diagrams, and these aren't the, you know, the cheap little copy and paste over a, an image type of a thing. These are diagrams that we actually spent days at a butcher uh, measuring distance between ribs, distance from front to back rib cage, height of the rib cage, uh, distance from the backbone to the top of the back. All these, you know, it's it's a very detailed and accurate diagram, uh, frontal broadside view, all of that. So you can bounce around, go from section to section, or you can start at the very beginning, and we have it laid out chronologically. So you start with planning your hunt and go into scouting. Uh, which includes, you know, using Google Earth, scouting from long distance. Uh, no matter where you are physically, geographically located, no matter where you are on the elk hunting experience or success curve, you're going to be able to walk through this course at your own pace and have a year basically to go back, take notes, go back and, and recap after the season, go back and, you know, go to part two, more detailed things. So it's it's set up very user-friendly. You can navigate from page to page and go to the next module, the next chapter, back to the home page. Uh, and there's there's over 40 pages, over 40 web pages within this course to to navigate through. Yeah, that's, a, that's an unbelievable amount of content. Um, 
yeah, pushing that 100,000 word mark plus the videos plus the diagrams, that's just, that's, that's an impressive feat. I mean, if you think about it, there's, there's nothing that's been done like this, not only for elk hunting, but really for hunting in general. I mean, there's certainly great guidebooks and there's how-to books and there's, as you mentioned, things like hunter education, but to have, I think, this much content species-specific that can apply to to new hunters, to experienced hunters, to resident hunters, to out-of-state hunters, all under one place. It's I'm I'm just super excited to see to see it all come together personally. I know you know kind of my backstory, Corey, but for the listeners who aren't aware, about five years ago, I was the guy in the Midwest who kind of always wanted to start elk hunting and was, you know, overwhelmed by the prospect of you know, A, learning on my own because I didn't know anybody, and then B, you know, undertaking this process from, you know, a thousand miles plus away, right? And so, totally. you know, I, I I did a lot of the research and piecing things together and, and putting it piece by piece, and I can only imagine um, how much shorter my learning curve would have been to have everything consolidated like this, so... You know, given my background and experience, it's, it's really cool to see it come together, for sure. Totally. No, and you know, that's, I've been elk hunting for over 30 years. Uh, it's a lot of experience, but at the same time, I've lost maybe a little bit of the, uh, certainly not the passion, but the understanding of what it's really like to to be so overwhelmed with that. You know, there's so many years of experience that have built up that I take some things for granted. And uh, I was excited, you know, I, I'm happy to share that I reached out to you and uh, asked you to, to contribute to the online course, especially with your perspective uh, from coming from the Midwest of what questions do you really need to ask? What are the things that are overwhelming? What are the challenges, the obstacles? And uh, so, you know, Mark, you had a, a huge part in especially the planning and some of the scouting modules of, of the online course from your perspective, which I think uh, adds an incredible amount of value to someone who's coming from back there in a similar situation, having never done it before and uh, just wanting to get into it for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I, you know, I certainly have my own perspective, but even, even that's been so influenced by, you know, the dozens and really hundreds of emails that I've received is people have kind of found, you know, the articles I've written and so many out of state guys kind of asking questions. So I guess go ahead. You mentioned it quick, but kind of talk a little bit about, um, maybe at a high level, the beginning of the course. Um, you know, I, I know even with this podcast, we have guys who are, you know, either from the Midwest or out East and want to, or have recently started hunting in the West. And we even have a ton of guys who live in the West who live in elk country and are just now getting into or continuing to learn about elk hunting that we've heard from, from this podcast. So kind of talk a little bit about some of the content that's there in terms of that kind of planning and scouting, kind of those pre-hunt um, content topics that this course can help prepare us with. For sure. You know, and to, to back it up just a little bit, I love surveys. I, I'm an engineer, so, you know, any time I can collect current relevant data and be able to to form products around that, it's it's very helpful. And so one of the surveys we did recently was, you know, we broke it up very detailed. How much experience do you have? How much success have you had? Have you ever hunted before? Have you ever been successful? Uh, are you consistently successful? And then what things are keeping you from that? What things contribute to your failure? What things contribute to your success? And got a really good look, uh, almost 10,000 responses. So a very wide, uh, a net, a very wide net was cast there and, and the responses came back that were very helpful. Uh, but one of the things uh, that came up towards the top of that was just the overwhelming aspect of planning a hunt, whether it's you know an out-of-state hunt or hunting for the first time. Uh, and as I started going through this module and, and really laying it out, there were things that got me excited after 30 years of hunting that I thought, I didn't never thought to do that before that's that makes a ton of sense or you know I'm, I'm going on an out-of-state hunt this year to a state I've never hunted in before I really need to to take some of this advice seriously and and do it myself so in the planning part you know we start off and just talk about expectations and logistics and the fact that 
success rates are 10 to 12 percent. So, you know, I, I think more than anything, yes, there's a ton of valuable information in, in this online course. But I hope at the end of the course that everyone who takes it, regardless of their experience uh, to begin with, is motivated, encouraged, and inspired to to be better or to go on an elk hunt for the first time. And so those expectations, we, we set some very real expectations from the beginning. You know, you have all of these things you have to consider about your budget, what weapon, your time frame, what's, what's your expectations for success. And then, you know, if you want to shoot a 300-inch six-point bull, you have to realize that overall success rates out west are 10 to 12 percent. You want it to be a mature six-point, that reduces it down to two or three percent. And the fact that this is your first elk hunt, you know, it's, you're off the charts with a low success rate. Right. So we established that from the beginning, not to discourage, but to say, you need to have a really solid plan here and, and realize what you're up against. And from there, lay out everything that you can do to, to maximize the time that you spend, not only in planning, but as you go through and, and actually execute the hunt. So, you know, those expectations are, are important. Uh, talk about you know, breaking down the seasons, what weapon you're going to be hunting with during different seasons, especially as we look at over-the-counter type tags where if you want to hunt during the rut, you're probably going to be stuck hunting with a bow. Uh, there's some opportunities to hunt with a muzzleloader and very few controlled opportunities to hunt with a rifle during the rut. Uh, and then, you know, go into when is the most hunting pressure. Uh, yeah, I, just that whole gamut. It's that first module is almost 20,000 words just on planning the hunt. Yeah. So there's a, a ton that goes into it. Talk about budgets. You know, what's it really going to cost for somebody to come out and go on an out-of-state hunt, including tags, gas, food, uh, everything we talk about, outfitted, non-outfitted, uh, do-it-yourself type hunts, groceries, taxidermy, the whole thing. You can really plan out a budget. And that's just in the first chapter of the planning yeah. your hunt. So that's a lot. Uh, from yeah. There, yeah, from there we go into obtaining elk tags. You know, that's that's overwhelming for a guy who lives out here and, and breathes elk hunting. It's like, how do I get an elk tag in New Mexico? What do I have to do in Colorado? You know, can I just show up and buy it? If I go to Oregon, they're over the counter, but I didn't realize I had to have it bought before the season opened. And mm -hmm. so we talk about all that and break down the top ten elk hunting states state by state uh, with all the information about how they use bonus points, preference points, how points work, uh, application deadlines. Do so they have over-the-counter hunts? Uh, just a very state-specific uh, for those top 10 states with, with a ton of information. Yeah, that's so cool. The uh, When you first kind of started that segment there, you mentioned there's some things that kind of, you know, triggered thoughts or... Um, things about your own out-of-state hunts. What were some of the specifics as you sort of went back through this content and were rethinking through things that you kind of was like, oh, yeah, we, we should think about that more or what have you? You know, one of the things that I think stood out probably most to me, I want to elk hunt every year. And I don't ever want, I mean, I, I have elk hunted every year since 1996, I believe, um, and pretty much every year before that, back to about 1987. And I couldn't imagine going a season without having an elk tag. So I always have, you know, I live in Idaho. I have within two hours of my, my front door, I can be hunting elk. But I also like finding new areas. I like exploring. I like seeing new states. I have a goal to, to be able to hunt an elk and to successfully hunt an elk in all 10 of the, the western elk hunting states, which I've just got three more left. But one of those states is, is coming up this fall. I'm going to New Mexico. And so as I look at that, just that my strategy for how to obtain these tags and to make sure that I have a plan not only for this season, but looking ahead three years and five years and maybe even 10 years. So I share that in here, what my strategy is for, for having an over-the-counter tag every year as well as having maybe a higher quality hunt to look forward to, you know, whether that's three years, five years, ten years down the, down the road. And so I'm to a point where I've almost exhausted uh, most of those, those hunts. I've hunted Arizona twice. Uh, I've got 11 points in Colorado. I've got uh, uh, Arizona. I'm back up, I think, to nine points. 
And so I'm kind of starting over with, with building points in a lot of those states, and I kind of panicked a little bit. I thought, man, the next two years I'm going to burn all my points. Mm-hmm. What am I going to have to look forward to? What am I doing? So I really had to dive back into my own strategy and kind of build it back up uh, to make sure that I have hunts in the future to look forward to and that I don't just cycle through my initial strategy and here I am 10 years later with no points again. So yeah. um, that, that was that was an important part of that for me was laying out what my strategy really is and then making sure that I was, was following my own strategy. Yeah, that's cool to hear. How do you, um, this is kind of a, you know, not about the course specifically, but just it kind of has me thinking, you know, one of the things we mentioned uh, that the course covers is, you know, really the, the beginning to the end of elk seasons from really late August all the way, you know, up until the end of the year and how the seasons change throughout the months and how behavior changes and how opportunity changes. And the course covers all that. But just wondering more specifically with you as you hunt multiple states per year, how does, uh, those how do those factors play into how you uh strategize your year of elk hunting um i mean clearly it's you know you're somewhat maybe limited by oh i want to hunt new mexico this year i have these level of points here's realistically what i can probably obtain in terms of a tag and so that that's probably would be number one priority in terms of determining when you hunt new mexico and then kind of filling in the gaps but talk a little bit about that for somebody who's maybe looking at hunting multiple states or is just kind of considering, you know, the pros and cons of hunting at different times of the year. For sure. You know, and that's honestly a, probably a whole podcast just in itself because yeah. there's so much that goes into, you know, the planning of a hunt. And, and one of the things I look at, well, there's, there's several things. First thing is obviously the seasons and those dates. And so there's some states, you know, Colorado opens a little earlier, Oregon opens earlier, uh, Utah opens really early, but, you know, into third, fourth week of August, those seasons are opening. So you have an opportunity uh, to go and hunt there early, but it's not great hunting. You know, we're, we're not into the real good calling times. I don't like to sit water just because I'm super impatient, but so it kind of limits me. You know, I want to start when the elk really start firing up so we're looking first part of september and then realistically for over-the-counter type stuff they're tapering off especially for archery hunts you know towards the end of september into the first week of october so you've got a four to five week window there to really plan plan the hunts i i try to do two different hunts a year and i try to have those hunts be from seven to eight days uh, with a with a break in between i did a 12-day hunt one time and it was just too much too much time being away from home from work from my family and uh, so I just kind of made a, a rule of uh, for myself to follow that I'm going to go on one hunt for seven or eight days come home for at least four or five days and then go back out for another seven or eight and so as I look at that I really have to compromise because my favorite time to hunt is that mid-month you know from the 10th to the 20th time frame the bulls are, are I think most susceptible to calling uh, just if it aligns with a good moon phase, that 10th to 20th time frame is my favorite week to go. The problem with that is it doesn't allow me a gap to be able to come home either before or after that and then go for another seven or eight days. So I almost always end up compromising that prime week of hunting to be able to go on two hunts, you know, rather than go on a 10 or a 10. 12 day hunt mm-hmm. uh, during that prime time. So I usually end up going like the 3rd to the 10th, and then coming home for a few days, and then going like the 15th to the 24th uh, type time frame. So you're kind and of catching, the same this year. So yeah, you're, sorry, yeah I to catch a little off, bit of that the, prime time. Yeah, the beginning of it, and then take a break and catch the end. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's so hard. I mean, it's really uh, a test of will to be able to come home for those five or six days knowing that that's that's potentially the prime time of elk hunting Uh, but it's just it's where i am in life right now with with a young family and busy schedule and you know it's it's uh i'm certainly not going to complain about getting to hunt for 14 (laughs) or 16 days during september and certainly very very blessed to do that but you know with with that in mind I, i start thinking what hunt is going to be best early in the season, what hunt is going to be best later in the season, you know, for areas like Idaho, 
Montana, Colorado, something like that. I'm probably going to lend uh, more of my time towards the beginning part of the season. And then areas like maybe Arizona, Utah, uh, New Mexico, some of those more desert units, um, more of a controlled type hunt. Uh, I'm probably going to look at going during what will end up being more of the prime time there, which is maybe that third or fourth week of September. So with that schedule, you know, it kind of things start falling together. I look at the moon phase and, and see where that's at and put the pieces together and then look at, okay, where do I have points? Can I draw a hunt this year? Is it going to fit into that first week or the third week? Uh, and it really kind of falls into place. So this year we're hunting over the counter in Idaho uh, that first part of the season. Uh, the season dates uh, that we're going to be out there are going to be, we're going to hunt early, like the first to the 10th. And then I'll be home you know, the 11th through the 17th this year, which honestly, if I could pick one week and only had one week to hunt, that 11th to the 17th would be the week. Um, but just with trying to get two hunts in, that's that's my compromise. And then uh, heading to New Mexico, I think the season's like the scene. There. So those are my two hunts and the, the planning that goes into it. Next year, I'm already looking head uh, draw the hunt I want to hunt in Colorado or the hunt I want to hunt in Arizona uh, but I really don't want to draw both of them in the same year so I'll probably do another general over-the-counter type hunt early next year and then go to Arizona probably uh, a little bit later during the, the latter part of the season down there yeah that's neat you mentioned uh, a couple things there that again are kind of big topics we could open up but just to cover briefly you mentioned moon phase and you said a good moon <laughs> phase and i think it's always interesting to hear um you know somebody's perspective on what is a quote-unquote good moon uh for hunting so how do you view that with all of your elk hunting experience and uh, what do you consider to be a good moon and how does the behavior respond accordingly for sure and it's that's just there, there's one more factor that's thrown into that the uh, the peak rut, the, what throws the cows into estrus so that they're ready to be bred is the, you know, when the, the length of the days in the fall are the same as the length of the night. And that happens this year, I think it's on September 22nd. So that is really what kicks off the peak rut. The actual cows coming into estrus, the bulls breeding them, and it usually falls within, you know, five to seven days of, of that date on the calendar uh, when that happens, and it, it changes from area to area. But if I'm going to pick when I want to hunt, I want to hunt the front end leading up to that date. So I want to hunt the five to seven days in front of September 27th, ideally. That's my that's my prime calendar date. Then if I look at the, the moon phases, and that happens to land on a full moon. So those five to seven days leading up to September 27th, if they land on a full moon, there's going to be a lot of rut activity, but they're going to be able to do a lot of that at night. And so it's going to make it uh, somewhat muted for the daylight hours for that rut activity. So I have to be aware of that. Ideally, I would love to either hunt three or four days after a full moon, so as the moon's waning, or the three or four days leading up to when it's going to be full but not quite full. So, um, you know, after a – if there's a new moon, so there's no moon – that can be tough hunting. The elk just aren't quite as active during that time frame. There's a little bit of light leading up to it uh, or leading away from a full moon. I found that that seems to be the most, if it coincides with that peak rut timing and everything, those those are the ideal combinations. Um, but then you have every combination mixed in with that, you know, heat, hot weather, early if you get a full moon with hot weather early, man, it can be brutal trying to hunt during daylight hours. Um, but again, with with the way my season is scheduled, sometimes I don't have the, the luxury of scheduling around that. So we have to have tactics and, and things that allow us to adapt our style of hunting and uh, methods of hunting to coincide with, with what we're given. And so that was a really long answer to a short question, but moon phase... I don't want to hunt a full moon. I want to hunt either as the moon is, is cresting into a full moon or as it's waning and going away from a full moon. Uh, and you usually have seven or nine days on both sides there that are, are really good. And then if that coincides with, again, that, that peak of the rut, 
before I want to hunt before that once the once the cows come in estrus and those herd bulls get focused on breeding uh, calling can be a lot less effective so I like to hunt as they're establishing their harems uh, a little bit in that earlier part of the season and uh, you know I've I've had good luck in every moon phase and what I'm talking about here is just that ideal if I could pick the perfect season that would be it but you definitely do you know, need to be aware of what the moon's doing and and how to adapt to be able to to overcome that challenge. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we <laughs> everything you just described remind me of why it was really difficult for us to seal the deal in Colorado last year. We were probably closer to the full moon than was ideal. It was late in September, so it was near that um, peak of the rut and really breeding activity. Bulls hid locked on to cows in most cases and then the third strike it was crazy hot and so we were dealing with a nearly full moon bulls who were already into cows and then a warm weather and it was it, was, it made for some tough hunting I and mean, we had a blast and had encounters but yeah it was uh it was a bit trying for sure absolutely and we cover all of that in the online course there's a full module on common challenges with elk hunting and a full chapter devoted to things that are somewhat out of your control you know the moon the heat forest fires hunting pressure uh, not only talk about the challenges but how you can overcome uh, those challenges and, and still be successful and then a full another chapter talking about the challenges that the elk themselves bring whether it's low densities whether it's high uh, high densities can sometimes be a challenge. The bull to cow ratios, the you know bulls that what what causes bulls to bugle and run or to not bugle at all, and those challenges and how to overcome them. So yeah, there's there's a lot that can uh, thwart our efforts to be successful. And really, when you break it down, it's no wonder the success rates are only ten to twelve percent. Yeah. One more quick question on the um, the kind of the rut and the behavior and timing of things. Have you noticed at all that? Um, the rut would be a bit later in, in southern states, can say, you know, hunting south in Arizona versus north in Idaho. Um, I mean, you mentioned it's kind of keyed off of that. Yes bite, and no. But... So what I've found is elk behave differ- differently depending on a lot of things, depending on how hard the winter was the, the year before, uh, depending on the hunt pressure you get in an over-the-counter area that they're getting hammered by hunters day after day after day they don't have the luxury of just saying you know what i'm going to sit back and wait until the day before the rut starts and i'm going to waltz down in there and round up the cows and you know i'm going to breed them and then i'm going to ride off into the sunset they don't have that luxury because they're continually the cows the herds are getting busted up and pushed around and so i think you find herd bulls hanging out with the herds maybe a little earlier in uh, in some of these you know more northern states where there are more over-the-counter opportunities you get to an area like arizona new mexico where it can be very structured because the pressures are the same you know they're limited on tags um, the dynamics of the herd the demographics of the herd the the populations the bull to cow ratios are very tightly managed to have more of a quality experience from our standpoint which makes it you know completely makes the rut uh, happen a lot differently than it does in areas that, that don't have that same tight grip on the management mm-hmm. and so yeah i think there's i've definitely noticed in you know arizona especially new mexico uh, that rut seems to you don't have a lot of the rutting action the big bulls with the herds uh leading up to like the 17th to the 20th time frame of september whereas if you come to idaho and hunt i've seen herd bulls like the big herd bulls that are going to be the ones doing the breeding with the herd on September 3rd, September 5th, actually wow. screaming their heads off, rutting, managing that herd that you don't get in some of those southern states. And Colorado, I think, has a good mix. You know, there's some units there where I think you you get into the bigger bulls coming out of the woodwork later, as well as some where you might find the, the bigger herd bulls with the herds earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating think, for me to think the way you mentioned Idaho that early that they would be really with the herd. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and we, you know, I've seen, I've I've hunted areas within Idaho that, you know, either the elevation's really high, so the winter, you know, lasts a little bit longer, and so those cows seem to come into estrus a little later, so the calves are born a little later in the spring in those higher elevation areas, so the rut 
actually starts a little later. Okay. Uh, I've seen in areas where there's a, a high number of bulls, and those big bulls, I've seen them grouped up the first week of September with three or four mature bulls uh, still hanging out together. And, you know, in other areas, that they wouldn't even tolerate another spike hanging around with them. So it's so area-specific and, and can change literally from one unit to the next in the same state. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one thing I always struggle with. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure you get thousands of questions, but with the questions that I've gotten over the years, you know, I get somebody who asks me questions generally like, well, what's it like in Colorado or this time? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it matters so much when you when you start talking about what week's the best, there's all these variables. When you start talking about what can I expect in, you know, this state, there's all kinds of variables among units and areas, and it is tough to generalize. But for sure, I think one thing that's helpful in this course is, you know, we can't, like, give the one right answer, but what this course does is really lay down all of the possibilities, I think, to make us more informed of the bigger picture and then help us interpret um, what might be going on now that we're kind of armed, if you will, with the bigger picture. So that's pretty neat. Totally. And I really think if I was to tell someone exactly what to do step by step, they could be successful. But I think there's so much value in explaining why I do things step by step. And I think that understanding the why will enable them to create their own how. I mean, I do share the how, but I go way deeper and explain the why that goes into it so that it, you know, it's that concept of, you know, give a man a fish and feed him for, for a night and teach a man to fish and feed him for a life. It's the same with this course in that I try to explain the why. So as you're out hunting and things are happening, you're understanding what's going on, not just reacting uh, with a set. This is what Corey would do. But being able to see the bigger picture and, okay, why are they not talking right now? There's bulls in here. Why aren't they talking? I break that down and, and explain the reasons why elk won't talk. And there's several reasons. But with that understanding of those reasons, you can start eliminating. Well, it's not because of the heat. It's not because of this. It's It's got to be this. And then you can come up with a, a strategy that will overcome that particular scenario. And say, so, yeah, I think it's it's just so much more important to to understand the behind the scenes, what's going on, and be able to apply your own experience and your own time spent in the woods with that that knowledge to be able to really shorten that learning curve and really increase success. Yeah, very neat. So let's transition and talk a little bit about um, what's timely for right now. Um, so as we look at coming off of Memorial Day leading up to, you know, 4th of July, guys are going to be really thinking about their seasons, doing some preseason scouting, whether that's from afar or with boots on the ground. But in general, give us an idea of recommendations that you would make to everyone that's hunting elk uh, this September or October. What should they be doing now in June and July to prepare for that? So I think by now, you know, everyone knows where they're hunting this fall. They've either you know, got a plan for an over-the-counter tag or they've drawn a tag. And so basically between the planning, which which is really done, and the boots on the ground starting the actual hunting season, there's only a few things that you really need to focus on. And uh, the first one is obviously scouting, knowing where you're going to go uh, specifically within that unit that you're going to hunt. And so you've narrowed down the area either by drawing a tag in a certain unit or you've you've bought a tag in a certain zone. And now you've got to find that, that spot within the spot, the actual area you're going to hunt. And just the advancements in technology the last five to ten years has been incredible and allow us to be able to scout. I spend very little time in the field scouting. Uh, I still do spend some time but really all I'm doing in the field is just verifying what I've, what I've found out from home. Uh, you can sit at the computer, find areas on Google Earth, transfer uh, waypoints from Google Earth to your GPS, and then go out in the field and walk right to a wallow that you located on Google Earth and say, yeah, it's still got water and it. it's going to get hammered this fall. Or, you know, there's a lot of elk activity in here. A lot of cows and calves are going to be here in the fall. So you don't have to go and spend weeks and months out in the actual field 
doing the scouting so it can be done from home. So I think right now, you know, the things that I'm focusing on for my hunts are finding those detailed little pockets, the areas that might get overlooked, the uh, the bedding areas, just knowing where potential bedding areas are so that if we get into one and there's no elk in this area, I know there's a bedding area over here, we can go and check it out and creating backup plans. So I think you know, right now it's important to to find those those little hidden pockets to come up with a bunch of backup plans and then become as familiar with the area as you can uh, without actually visiting it. And then as it transitions, you know, later into the summer here, the next month or two, if you do have the opportunity to to go and spend some time in that area, uh, you're going to have all this information to walk in there with and and not waste much time on the ground scouting, be able to really fine-tune that and be ready for season. You know, one of the other areas to consider this time of year is gear, making sure that the gear is... uh, ready to go for season, whether that's going on a camping trip with family and setting up a tent, you know, putting weight in your backpack, uh, breaking in new boots, practicing with the elk calls. Uh, there, there are a lot of pieces there that if you're working throughout the summer on your gear, whether that's acquiring new gear or just proving the gear that you have, uh, I think it's it can eliminate a lot of the uh, panic that happens a couple weeks before season, just knowing my gear's all set, I've got it, I've got a gear list here, I've gone over it a hundred times throughout the summer, so now's a good time to be thinking about, do I need to replace any gear? Uh, where, where are my weaknesses in my gear list? Do I, do I need to improve the fit of my pack? Do I need to um, get an insulating layer, a vest or something? So now's yeah. a good time to be thinking about that. And then, you know, the the other critical component is physical conditioning, which hopefully by now everyone's at least started, but uh, it's definitely not too late to start if you haven't. And just fine-tuning that physical conditioning to to get in elk shape, to be ready for elk season, Uh, you know, hiking with a heavy pack on, doing some things that are going to improve your endurance, your cardio, um, spending maybe a little less time working on biceps and a little more working on legs and <laughs> you know just the those things we're, we're down to to just a couple months away you know two three months from now we're going to be actually elk hunting so i think fine-tuning the actual things we're going to be doing in september whether it's you know the use of gear uh, physical conditioning the on the ground finding elk uh and then maybe the last one uh, as weapon you know if you're not shooting your bow right now and you're an archery hunter you need to be shooting your bow right now right. you know and it's it's uh so th- those are the four things i think uh scouting shooting your bow proving your gear and and working on physical conditioning that are important from now until season starts here in just a few more months yeah i'd, I'd love to talk just a bit about more sc- a bit more about scouting and this really goes back to uh, a question that we got through the podcast that i think is a great question and eric wrote in and was saying that he's lived in montana now for four years um he's hunted elk for two of those four years one successful one not um and it's he's basically saying that every time he heads into the elk woods to scout he becomes overwhelmed really just with the task of finding animals <laughs> and so what can he do really to maximize the time that he has in the field for preseason scouting because i mean clearly some of us can't make out at all and need to rely on the tools and the technology that we talked about and really that the course dives deep into but for those of us who can get to elk country but maybe not for you know a week maybe we have this weekend, this day, and one more weekend. How do you maximize the time when you get boots on the ground to scout in elk country? Totally. So, Eric, you definitely want to buy the online course, but <laughs> we go <laughs> that will through. Help. Yeah, no, and there's so much, and and I've actually hunted Montana twice myself. And between Montana and Colorado, I would say those are the two states that I've had the most difficulty. Um, finding that area within the area, finding the hot spot. And I think a lot of the reason is there is so much area that's good elk country there in both of those states. There's just, I mean, you can throw a dot, uh, a dart at a map, and you're probably going to hit elk country. And, you know, with that much elk country, and, and even though those are probably the two two of the top three states for elk populations, they're going to end up being a little bit spread out and, and a little spotty. So, uh, Montana was tough for us the first time. We got into elk. 
but it was like one elk here and we'd walk four or five miles and find one more elk. They just weren't concentrated like like what I like to find. And we were hunting earlier in the season, so it made it difficult. So next time I went back, you know, it was a little different story, but but uh, I can definitely see a pattern in Montana of if you're hunting that general tag or the general elk license there, uh, you have a lot of areas to choose from and there's a lot of country to choose from within those areas and it all looks really good. So how do you how do you find that needle in the haystack? So for me, I you know, like you mentioned, trying to maximize scouting from home so that you just aren't spending days and days in the field fruitlessly trying to find elk. Uh, I start out with Google Earth. Everything starts with Google Earth for me. And I've got one of the old uh, Onyx Maps uh, overlays for Google Earth that shows all the public versus private property. It shows the units. Uh, so I know what units are open for the general license. And so that narrows me down to a, a general area. From there, you know, it's more than just throwing a dart at the map. I've got to have some intel saying, you know, success rates up here are good or hunting pressure up here is low, something that's driving me towards a more specific area. And from there, I jump on Google Earth, and honestly, I just do flyovers of, of all of this area. And if there are areas that are just gridded with roads, I'm not even going to you know slow down there. I'm going to keep flying until I find areas that are more remote. So there's four things that I look for. I want to find food sources. So food sources can be a lot of things. When you're looking on Google Earth, it can be a big open field. Uh, it can be an open ridge. It can be a grassy uh, drainage, you know, open meadow along a, a creek in the bottom of a draw. But I want to find some open places because elk are going to want to come out in those open places. There's better feed in there. They're going to be able to come out there and browse, uh, and that's probably where you're going to be most likely to see them last light first thing in the morning. So I want to find some of those open ridges or open areas. It's going to tell me there's good feed sources. I want to find water and reliable sources of water. So whether that's you know some kind of a lake or a pond that's that's tucked back in. On Google Earth, you can see really green areas. So I want some really green areas. And again, if the if the image is taken in May. Uh, it might be a whole different story in September or October, but if I'm finding some green areas that's indicating, hey, there's some high mountain springs in here, or this creek, you know, the image is taken in August, so it's probably a, a year-round water source. Uh, they have to have water, and they're going to be traveling to water every day. And then the last part, which for me is probably the 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 link to the food and water, and probably the thing that I put a little bit more weight on, Ban food or water is the bedding area. Elk wanna they want a secure place to bed down during the day, and if we're hunting in September, it's probably going to be pretty warm during the day. So they're going to want some place that's a little cooler. So I'm looking for the really dark green, heavy timbered areas on the north facing slopes when I'm on Google Earth. And honestly, if you fly over a, a say you break the unit into uh, eight different sections and you fly over that one eighth section of a unit, these areas are going to really stand out. I mean, they're going to start popping out like, oh, there's a prime spot right there. It's got a beautiful basin with a north facing slope over there for bedding. There's a couple benches there that they could bed on on that north facing slope. They've got open ridges right around the corner from it. And then look, there's all of this lush green stuff at the bottom end of the basin with a lake up here and a creek running through the bottom of the drainage. You look at that, and they've got everything they need right there. And if I can triangulate those three things and find them at least a mile off of a road, I, you know, it, when you start looking in that one eighth of the unit section, there's really only probably ten or twelve areas that jump out at me as these are prime elk habitats. And so I'll mark all ten or twelve of them, and then, uh, you know, when I go out and do my scouting, I pick three or four that are close in close proximity to each other, and I go in there. And I verify what I found. Is there water? You know, do, am I finding bedding areas? And the thing I really want to find if I'm going on a summer scouting trip, anytime from like right now, first part of June, all the way through the, the middle of August, I'm not looking for bulls. I'm looking for signs of previous rut, and I'm looking for cows and calves because, honestly, the cows and calves are probably going to stay in the same place they are right now all the way through the rut. And that's where the bulls are going to come to find them. So if I'm finding cows and calves right now, there's a good chance that the rut's going to happen there. So if I'm seeing cows and calves 
and I'm finding a bunch of rubs and some old wallows that they used the previous season, there's a pretty good indication that if the bulls aren't there right then, they're probably going to be there you know, around that 10th of September when they start looking for the cows. And so I'm, when I'm on the ground doing actual scouting, I'm verifying those areas and I'm looking for signs of previous rut. I'm looking for current elk activity. And if I find those things, there's a, there's a really good chance when I go back in September that, that there's going to be elk there and there's going to be some rutting activity. Yeah, man. But it's a, such a hopeful brick town and just I, so cool to hear to hear how somebody with your experience approaches that from a mindset perspective of what they're looking for. That's so incredibly helpful. I'm not even going to ask another question at this point, A, because we're getting close to time, and B, that's just... It's so good. That's so helpful to so many hunters I know and to myself personally. Let's go ahead and wrap up, Corey. Just what else do you want to leave us with about this course or anything else uh, uh, for all these elk hunters who are chomping in the bit these last few months here to get to season? <laughs> you know, we're, uh, we've just barely even scraped the ice off the windshield here with, with what we've talked about in the course. You know, we talked a little about planning. Uh, a little about scouting, a little about moon phases. All of that is covered in in huge detail in the course. Um, you know, the, the scouting portion with Google Earth, I sit down at the computer and fly over an area and highlight these areas that, that stand out to me, uh, triangulating the feed, the water, the bedding, showing what it looks like on Google Earth and, and actually show areas that I'm – I'm looking at saying these are prime looking areas. Of course, I I uh, cropped out the part with the coordinates down in the bottom right corner of Google <laughs> Earth there. But, but I mean, going through so that anyone, wherever they're hunting, can find these same areas and, and look at it. But in a nutshell, the course is, you know, over 30 years of my experience, I tapped into your experience, uh, you know, and there's several others that have contributed as well to it. Randy Newberg, um, just the guys on the Elk 101 Pro staff that, you know, we've got over 500 years of elk hunting experience on the Elk 101 Pro staff. And so tapping into into their knowledge and saying, hey, take a look at this. What can I add to it? What did I miss? Uh, you know, what can we do to make this the most robust and comprehensive uh, resource for elk hunting on every aspect? You know, I spend 30 minutes with an elk call in my mouth talking about how to become a better elk caller, breaking down the elk call very systematically to, to improve your elk calling. Um, the anatomy diagrams that we have are, are insane, just showing exactly where bone structure is, where vitals lie in the elk. You know, not a guess, an actual picture of a, an elk laying there with, with all of that stuff measured and, and then put onto a picture. So it's the, the end goal of the University of Elk Hunting online course is to make people more confident in their abilities, regardless of where they start at. I, I'm confident there's going to be something in there that every elk hunter is going to find valuable and be able to say, you know what, this was worth my time to, to sit down and dig through this. And and uh, it's not in any way a, an ego thing or me saying I'm a great elk hunter or a better elk hunter than anyone I'm just excited to be able to have all of this information collaboratively put into one location so that any elk hunter of any level can come in here and finish it and be a better elk hunter when they're done. Yeah. And I'm I'm super excited for the final product to be out and available and for people to get it in their hands and learn. Um, thank you so much for not only putting that together. Obviously, I know it's been a Herculean effort, and I hope it does incredibly well for you guys, but... Thanks for joining us again today and hopping on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on. And it's uh, always fun talking elk hunt, especially now as we get down to crunch time. And it'll it'll be here before we know it. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Really hope you guys enjoyed that one. Once again, that coupon code to access the online course is backcountry. All one word. You'll save 40%. Go ahead and check that out at elk101.com forward slash online course. Also, again, just want to remind you, contact us at any time, podcast at xomountaingear.com. And if you're enjoying the show, we would love to see your feedback as a review on iTunes or wherever you might be listening to this. Until next time, guys, thank you so much for listening and happy hunting.